Hey, Brassfax here. One of the biggest upsides, I think, of uh, being a YouTuber, uh, outside of getting skin cancer uh, daily in the hot Utah summer heat, is that I can test out harebrain wild ideas related to firearms contents, see if they work, see if they don't work, and spend an exorbitant amount of money in the process, because that's kind of what I do as a YouTuber, right? So, starting out, we have this guy, a standard SPR. You've seen this on the channel time, time, and time again. That was a lot of times. Standard 18 inch barrel, slightly thicker than average barrel, not quite a bull barrel, but it's getting there. Uh, two to 10 or two to 2.5 to 10 X optics, dialable turrets, you know, parallax, whatever, you know, the usual stuff. Excellent, amazing, absolutely fabulous. We've all seen it probably to death at this point. Which brings us in SPR where I chopped off four inches, four and a half inches off the barrel to bring you this thing, another SPR. Yeah, uh, I think at this point, a lot of people are probably thinking, ah, oh, holy shit, Brassfax has completely lost it. Why would you, why would you chop off four inches of a long range precision weapon set up like this? Not everyone watches all of my videos and some of these are pretty old. So real quick for those that need a refresher, I'm going to dabble in explaining both parts of the name, Urban SPR. Why urban? Why SPR? Warning, the following is extremely pedantic and displays extreme levels of fire autism from a presenter that has not been there nor done that and thus all of his purely hypothetical. I will heavily focus on build logic that led to this build and thus will spend a lot of time not actually discussing the build. Viewer discretion is advised. Okay, so starting with urban, despite the cultural prevalence of living on your own Red Dawn fantasy style by bugging out in the mountains with just what you can carry on your back and if you are lucky in a car, the rest of us must actually live and prep for the real world, where our house is where our preps are, our family is, and where we need to hitch our metaphorical horse to. 99% of my viewers, you guys, live proximal to a town, several towns, or more likely even a metropolitan city, within 50 to 100 miles. So that means, despite the downsides, and despite the memes of urban is always death, we actually have to contend with the fact that in any event, you're going to be dealing with a problem set that generally involves urban, semi-urban, or semi-rural areas. Thus, preparing for urban or semi-urban style encounters is honestly a pretty good call for most of us. As for the rifle, I'm an advocate for simply just having one balanced fighting rifle, something that can handle most scenarios thrown at it, because we, as civilians, don't have the intel flexibility, pre-mission planning, to the same degree that the military has. But there is a time and a place, if you have the funds, and more importantly, the ability to train with it, where having a secondary or tertiary rifle that is more range-oriented might have its place, hence the SPR. In this context, I've discussed why, even in urban scenarios, magnification is king, Cities cannot only match, but also potentially even exceed what we would consider the typical comfort range of an SPR style rifle. While I wouldn't configure everyone in my team to run a precision oriented rifle, there is merit to having that capability in the metaphorical toolbox for certain scenarios and mission types. You have a system with a higher quality glass for observation, quick observe to shoot time, first round hits are significantly more likely because the system is built for it, and terminal performance is enhanced at least over ball due to the likelihood of you using something like a Mark 262 analog, right? 77 grain OTM. The SPR concept plays well into this reality of smallish prepper teams because, well, these teams generally are going to have manpower issues as one of the most limiting factors. And the reality is a single point home is difficult to defend. Here, recon and preemptive scouting and action is the name of the game as disaster scenarios potentially stretch from just weeks now into months and years. I've discussed this heavily into this video. Click on it up here if you're interested. But ultimately the TLDR, because no one actually clicks those links, is if you run a small group, you may find the most effective way to defend your home is not at the gate, at the door, but via recon patrols into high rise strong points in the area, buildings, elevated terrain, you name it. What you lack in numbers will be attempted to overcome with a strong intel backbone of the area, area studies, heat map, for the foot traffic, you potentially spot troublemakers uh, before they're at your doorstep. In the context, even if you're in a larger community, something that you've built up post or pre collapse scenario, the ability of a small observation team to hold up in a critical observation point like mountain passes, high rises, you name it, or other such MSRs, allow for a very small manpower investment to handle the bulk 
of recon foot traffic uh, into certain areas, and it will act as either early warning or, if needed, as a spoiling force in the event of certain scenarios. The SPR, in my opinion, is the key weapon in this context. At least one member in the team has a weapon designed not only to help observe, uh, add a couple hundred yards to the average rifleman engagement range, but it does so far more consistency with very consistent first round hit probabilities and far better follow up shots. But unlike, say, a you know, 308 or 65 sapper system, the 556 SPR still remains lightweight and nimble enough to functionally flex back into a fighting rifle roll. Key in small unit sizes where every single man matters and you don't have the luxury of just saying, ah, he's the sniper dude, he only does sniper things. Coming to you live from the budget poppy fields of budget Afghanistan, it's Sunflowers and it's Utah. You guys know the drill. This video is sponsored by Venture Surplus. If you haven't figured it out yet, Venture Surplus is a, well, surplus location where you can buy surplus gear new and used. Today, Venture Surplus wants me to bring your attention to, well, this shirt. It's not any shirt, it's a brown shirt. It's the waffle topper. For many of you, it's starting to get cold, real cold. And despite all of the cool gear, the cry overlayers, the expensive pants, the cry combat pants, I don't know why I'm mentioning cry so much, but the core of any cold weather system is the underlayers. And this, well, this is an underlayer. So it functions very well to keep you warm in a vi wide variety of situations. It acts as a thermal, but the unique thing with how this is designed with its a waffle style layering is that it keeps you warm even as a singular layer, kind of like a, a sweater or a jacket. So yes, while well, the hallmark of a, you know, oh wow, we're double fisting it. Uh, the hallmark of a long range SPR is yes, that thicker boy barrel. The more I do shooting, the more I come to the conclusion that, hmm, maybe, maybe it's not that necessary. We certainly appreciate the, the effectiveness that we get out of a longer barrel. But in certain scenarios, an urban scenario, some of those benefits might not be as necessary because really what is a bigger boy, what is a long barrel really getting us? Well, it's getting us velocity. And velocity is mostly in a thing related to terminal performance. More importantly, however, this longer barrel isn't free. It, it costs us something, usually money, but also stuff on our rifle. For example, there are some things that are distinctly lacking on this rifle. Uh, ignore the fact that there is no flashlight. I harvested it. It's gonna go back on shortly. But even if there was a flashlight on here, you'll notice there's typically no night vision equipment. Why? Because it's incredibly front heavy. You'll notice there's no suppressor on here. Why? Because it's a lot of fucking weight and it's a lot of weight in the worst area to put the weight. And it's exasperated by the fact that we have a long, heavy barrel. Now, I can certainly wield this, but I don't want to. That has a number of issues beyond just balance on the gun. If it was just balance on the gun, we'd tolerate it, and a lot of people still do tolerate it. But in certain scenarios, especially in, you know, urban, there's a bug down my shirt. But especially uh, in certain scenarios, specifically urban, a long spear-like gun just starts to make almost no sense whatsoever. Obviously in CQB, this thing is going to be bashing into doorways. You're gonna get stuck in doorways. You can certainly do it, especially with a lot of practice, but it's a lot of work. And a lot of times people are just gonna take the damn thing off. Now you could probably tell, you could probably be that guy in your team and be like, hey, can you guys be point man for me? Which sure. Or you can make the notion that I'm just gonna Molotov every CQB situation, which is sure, whatever. Um, but that also excludes the fact that even outdoors, right? that this thing is going to hit the ground a lot. It's going to bash up against objects. It's gonna burn the shit out of your knees because it, it's, it's out there so much. Moving around cover, kind of really obnoxious with this, doesn't even fit in frame with this spear of a gun. Um, other situations, even when you're out in the bumfuck nowhere, trying to get around rocks, moving around cover, right? You're crouched, the gun is up here. This is still at my knee level if I were crouched, and my hands are all the way up here. It just has a tendency to hit the ground, even if you're incredibly careful. It's why we don't really see them in this configuration all that often. Now, we absolutely do, we can deal with these things, but that's where the twist comes in. What if we don't need to deal with these things? What if we can just run a system like that? And that's the whole premise of what I'm getting at with this urban SPR. And that's not even talking about like the rigidity component. Why do we need all that bull barrel rigidity? Well, it makes the barrel more rigid, which increases accuracy. It also acts as a large heat sink, meaning we don't have nearly as much heat loss, or we don't have nearly as much accuracy loss due to, well, heating, extreme heating. 
But in the context of, once again, urban or semi-urban style operations, well, if we're shooting that much, we probably don't really care about having a half MOA gun, we just care about getting rounds that range. All this together starts to begin to make the ludicrous case that maybe a longer barrel on a, you know, sniper style, SPR style system isn't necessarily a necessity. Look at this mag <laughs> here. Oh, we need the sun. Let's rotate the ass. Look at that. Can you give us a little shake? A little it's bit more. Good, 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 re good retention. Yeah. Oh it's like dollar bills. That's what I like to see. <laughs> <laughs> we are keeping, to use a video game term here, all of the attachments the same. We're still using an MPVO. We're still using turrets with it. We're still using parallax adjust. We're still going to be using a precision oriented barrel because we care about precision. That's the whole point after all, right? We're still going to use a bipod because bipods are the king of impromptu stabilized position, which is the whole point of this thing, right? And easily, most importantly, we're still using OTM precision match style ammo. In fact, we're heavily relying on it now because without it, we begin to not just cut into our precision ability, but our ability to negate wind and our terminal effect loss from going to a shorter barrel system. Now we have an 18 to 20 inch barrel down to something like a 13.7, maybe 16 inch barrel range. This ends up actually shaving off an enormous amount of weight alone. We're also probably going to choose a lighter profile barrel. Like in this case, I used a mid taper bro uh, profile, profile, profile barrel from Geisley. Still maintains the precision we're used to from that heavier thicker boy barrel, but it's still functionally capable of sustained fire due to barrel materials. Unfortunately, kind of dual purpose barrels like this, right? Very accurate cold hammer forged barrels tend to cost a bit of money over your standard stainless barrel. But this loss of weight and overall length allows us to mount something that we really weren't able to do with a longer rifle system, and that is mount a suppressor. I need to do a video on why suppressors are so massively useful despite their pain in the assness, but they reduce your signature both visually but also auditorily down range and how far your gunshot may carry as something that is obviously a gunshot. Personally, in my case here, I have a flow-through can on here, so I don't actually need adjustable gas, but I would consider potentially if you had a standard, you know, baffle stack suppressor that an adjustable BCG or gas block would be appreciated here. We don't want this thing to be incredibly overgassed. My combo ultimately ended up here being, you know, not nearly as big of a velocity loss as you'd imagine. A 14.5 compared to an 18 inch rifle will generally net you about 100 FPS loss or so. Quick, I can hear you complaining in the comments. Remember, we're not using M193, which is incredibly barrel dependent uh, and lower in weight. 77 grain OTMs are already kind of slow. Thus, as you reduce barrel, you don't lose nearly as much velocity, right? Because a lot of that velocity is tied up in momentum with the, the, the barrel, with the bullet weight, right? So in my personal case here, I swapped from Norma 77 grain on an 18 inch setup, not a slow round by any means. It's, it's pretty spicy in the, the grand scheme of 77 grains to this 14.5 inch barrel with a 77 grain AAC, the new ammo from uh, Palmetto State Armory. With a suppressor on it, I actually ended up with basically the same velocity, 2630 FPS down from 2670 FPS, which honestly sounds Super weird, right? Seems like some black magic occurred here, but you have to consider that suppressors tend to add not a significant amount, but some FPS gain, in this case, 20 to 50 FPS. So we added a little sprinkle bit from the AAC being slightly faster, and I ended up actually in practice not losing nearly as much as I thought. In more realistic scenarios, maybe if you already had a suppressor on or you're not using a suppressor in the post example, uh, you're gonna be losing at most about 100, 120 FPS. The usage of open tip match means we really don't feel the burn nearly as much here, say, when we lose velocity when using ball ammo, right? OTM rounds tend to get overstated at how effective their terminal performance is, but they're still significantly better versus M193 or M855. This died also lets us, if we want, mount a laser aiming module, further bridging that gap between general purpose rifle and sniper system. On Hop setup, he's using a ultra lightweight USNV DIR-1, it's a little cute thing here, but honestly, you could probably get away with a full capability laser. And that's how much front heavy weight we've actually saved. 
This one doesn't have one because I've actually, you know, run out of laser aiming modules. They're all in different guns. But, and I'm also trying out uh, passive aiming via active aiming with the Surefire Vampire Light. Saves so much weight. I'm uh, seeing how much I like it, right? Night Vision isn't necessarily the primary purpose of this thing, but it's good to have it on board if you are Night Vision capable. Ultimately, that's really about it. it yeah, looks like a GPR. We chopped off four inches of a barrel and kept all the other shit the same. Because this is ultimately a concepts video, I'm not really gonna talk about what I put on my you know, urban DMR. But if you'd like to see that, see the parts list, discuss why certain parts are the way they are, I'm going to link in the top right hand corner here a video I do with Hop. It's either going to end up on his channel or we're going to put it on the subscribe star. A quick shill moment if you enjoy that video, well, consider perhaps hitting up my subscribe star and being my sugar daddy. Most content will be in a similar vein. It's typically audio only podcast style, but sometimes we'll include video, sometimes it'll be in a live format, so with cameras. You name it. Okay, anyway, that's enough of that. What the fuck? All right, we don't need that one. For right most situations, I'm just going for an 11.5 with a suppressor and night vision equipment on it, but, but, for other scenarios, for any scenarios where I want precision or want something like this in the team, this over the 18 inch is probably gonna become more of my go-to. Now, there, I'm not the only one that's, uh, this is not a novel concept. Uh, Risky Krisky, I believe, runs something like this, though he typically doesn't run a suppressor and a bipod. He just keeps it super light and runs an optic like this. And then I believe Eric, I think Eric's the one that's running it from Barrel and Hatchet, has a very similar setup to that as well, where he runs a 2.5 to 10X GLX uh, and then runs it in this configuration as his go-to, you know, general purpose rifle. I'll disagree on the... Uh, the uh, terminology, but it's it's fundamentally the same exact concept as display. So go watch their shit if you're interested in seeing one of these bad boys in action just that little bit more. Regardless, thanks thanks for watching. Um, oh, the wind's kicking up, so hopefully this will hide like this. So thanks thanks for watching. Uh, yeah, no, there's really not much to say. Yeah, appreciate you guys uh, showing up time and time again to view this content, and uh, hopefully this one was at least remotely interesting to you as a kind of proof of concept more so than anything else and uh yeah we'll see you guys see you guys in the next one Dope.